idea for a short story. South African Justice Richard Goldstone played a crucial role in the transition from the apartheid regime to a functioning democracy. He was then in charge of setting up the International War Crimes Tribunal in The Hague, but the roots of his human rights sensibilities predate his professional career. When I went to university, I became angry and frustrated because I was meeting black students as equals on the campus of Advertisement University in Johannesburg. And once we got off the campus, we lived in two different worlds. They had to live in segregated black townships, poorly resourced, no uh, tarred roads. Many of them had no electricity or running water. I went home to a very comfortable uh, upper middle class suburb with my own library and comforts. And uh, it was that really that got me angry and into politics as a student. Did that resonate in some way with the Jewish background, that anger at segregation or racial discrimination? I was not directly affected by the Holocaust. We had no family who were directly affected, so it was very much a second and third hand uh, experience, but, but it certainly, uh, from a very young age, I remember not being able to, to understand certainly how Jews could be, uh, uh, could, could participate in any form of uh, racial or other forms of discrimination, having been at the receiving end for so many centuries. But you didn't start out at uh, human rights and humanitarian law, you started out doing corporate law. Well, well, generally speaking, I was always from my student days involved with human rights and uh, in, involved in uh, fighting discrimination and fighting apartheid. Uh, and I took that with me onto the bench. One of your most important decisions was about the Group Areas Act. Uh, can you elaborate about that? The Group Areas Act was a statute which enabled the South African government to keep uh, South Africa residentially segregated. It was a criminal offence for people of colour blacks, Asians, uh, so-called coloured people. It was an offence for them to live in white areas. And all the good areas were designated as white areas. And uh, I was involved in a case in 1982 um, where an elderly Indian woman uh, was charged with having li been, been living in a white area. Uh, and it seemed to me that, that it was not, not on to use a law that provided for kicking people out to keep them in. And I said, in this case, there shouldn't have been an eviction order at all. And as it turned out, and it certainly I can't claim to have anticipated it, but as it turned out, that was the last prosecution under the Group Areas Act. And within a few years, there were tens of thousands of black South Africans were moving into white areas. And then you took uh, uh, active part in the dismantling of the apartheid uh, uh, system, especially with the Commission of Inquiry into Public uh, Violence and Intimidation. That must have been a very strange experience. It was. Well, it came, it started really a bit before that. I was, because of these opinions I'd given, um, my name had become well known, particularly in the black community, for, for fairness and for uh, not approving. There, was, there were other opinions too along, along the same line. And um, for, for that reason, uh, towards the end of apartheid, when uh, there were certain incidents that could have derailed the whole transition, I was approached by the then government of President de Klerk uh, to, 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 to inquire into situations. One of them was shortly, it was a week after Mandela's um, a release from prison after 27 years, his daughter's boyfriend and the father of her, of her child was found hanging dead in a police cell in Johannesburg. Mm -hmm. And there were allegations that, that he'd been murdered by the police and tortured. And um, that was a critical issue right at the beginning of the negotiation process. And it was something I inquired into and I found beyond any question that he, in fact he did commit suicide and hadn't been murdered. And that led to another commission when police fired into a marching group of some 60,000 protesters, black protesters, and they opened fire with live ammunition, killing and injuring many of them. Again, I was appointed to investigate that. And there I found the police guilty of homicide and murder. And that cost the government many millions of uh, rands in, in, in compensation. And it, it, it was those two that really led to my appointment to head the Commission of Inquiry into Violence and, and Intimidation. As part of a body that was supposed to increase democracy, you were granted 
powers that are, you know, frankly undemocratic. Well, we weren't living in a democracy, and I'm very happy that those powers would be unconstitutional <laughs> today. Uh, but they were crucial then, mm -hmm. uh, because we would never have uncovered what Nelson Mandela had been calling a third force, that there were, were elements in the South African uh, army and, and, and police that, that were provoking the violence in an effort to, to derail the peace process. Were you conscious of making history? I think so. It, it was, it were, these were clearly earth-shattering from a South African point of view. And after that, um, um, did that open up your interest or your appetite to work on human rights and later on humanitarian law as such? Not really. Things happened too, too rapidly because at the end of that commission, th that commission ended with the election, with our first democratic election in April 1994. <coughs> I, I, my wife and I went on a vacation to Italy, and when I came back, there was the invitation uh, to become the chief prosecutor of the War Crimes Tribunal. That must have resonated with you, because I mean, the, the former example of any kind of court like The Hague was a Of course, it was a very exciting prospect, but it, it, was, it was a daunting responsibility to set up the first ever international prosecutor's office and to work within the, U within the UN, which itself is a challenge. Uh, it's a very bureaucratic, difficult organization to work in. And, and some people, in fact, after I accepted the job, some, many people said to me, you must be crazy to agree to work for the UN. And, uh, you know, I went as a lamb to the slaughter, and <laughs> I, I was ignorant of what I was letting myself in for. But, of course, it was a wonderful experience and changed, changed my life. Are you happy with the way it turned out? Oh, very much so. I think it was... You know, I think, I think the proof is there. We wouldn't have an international criminal court now in The Hague if the Yugoslavia and Rwanda tribunals hadn't, hadn't been successful. The previous international court that, had, that was even closely resembling the, what we have now in The Hague was the Nuremberg trials right. that ended the Second World War. Did that resonate with you? I know, I realize your family did not go through the Holocaust, but with your Jewish background? Well, of course. You know, Nuremberg was something that fascinated me uh, from, from, from a young student, and so too the Eichmann trial, one traces the whole, the whole, history, the whole history through that. And of course, Nuremberg was, was, was a watershed. We wouldn't have international criminal law um, uh, today in the form in which it's taken without Nuremberg. And uh, that, that, that's very important, the whole idea of universal jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. uh, which, was the, which was really the raison d'etre to the Eichmann trial and the, the whole approach of the Israeli courts to it, that, that there was universal jurisdiction uh, for, for what are international crimes. And that's become, that's become the law. So, of course, I was very uh, uh, conscious and uh, um, uh, enthralled with the, uh, you know, connecting the dots. What is the sense of justice that moves you? What moves me is the effect that justice has on victims. It's really the victims who are the customers, or should be the customers. They're often forgotten. Uh, but, but, but justice is for victims, whether it's in domestic courts or whether it's in international courts. Uh, it's, it, it, it's the victims who need the acknowledgement, and that's what justice gives them. Whether it's prosecutions or truth and reconciliation commissions, it doesn't matter. Uh, victims are craving for that public acknowledgement of their victimhood, what happened to them. And I've seen this time and again in South Africa and Rwanda and the former Yugoslavia, uh, in Kosovo. Uh, it, it, it's a very important aspect of justice. It's such an optimistic view from somebody who's had to look at such terrible cases. Right, well, it, well, it is, but it's, it's what, it's, you know, I think if, if, I always say if all of us were pessimists, we'd still be in caves. I mean, <laughs>